All right, so I'm going to get things started um, and just kind of keep this going from the last panel, which was a really phenomenal, um, just a really phenomenal panel. We all, I'd like to also thank the panelists before. Um, let's actually give them all a round of applause. So the next panel, the Sanctity of Black Bodies, Creating Spaces for Wellness and Joy, will be moderated by Dee Nichols. Through a multidisciplinary creative practice, creative practice, Dee Nichols mobilizes global change makers to activate ideas that address civic and social changes within their communities. Currently, Dee Nichols is a 2020 Loeb Fellow in residence here at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Dee additionally serves as a principal of design and social practice at Civic Creatives, a design strategy agency in St. Louis, Missouri, that develops interactive experiences, tools, and initiatives to help communities engage issues of civic disengagement, youth development, social inclusion, food access and security, and arts and cultural policy. Please welcome Dee Nichols. Thank you so much, Khalil, and thank you all so much for having me. Um, it's an honor to moderate this panel uh, with such spectacular uh, panelists and, and designers and practitioners. Uh, but I, I think we all agree that this is such an important conversation to have uh, as we prepare to close the day. Um, and I, I hope that we can really do uh, justice to talking about the power of the black body with this. Uh, it's an honor to, to introduce everyone, so I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, our first panelist is Denise Shanti Brown, uh, who is a holistic, yeah, yeah, uh, a holistic design strategist, mental health advocate, creative healer, and feminist entrepreneur, uh, co-designing possibilities for health and healing in Baltimore. As the creator and cultivator of the experience designed for the well-being of black women, her practice is dedicated to actualizing self-recovery and transformation through design. Denise believes that creative, hands-on healing experiences can shape possibility and embolden communities to develop the tools and strategies they need to heal themselves. She holds a master's in social design from the Maryland Institute College of Art, aka MICA, um, and embodied frameworks discovered during her feminist business school in recognition through leadership awards and fellowships celebrating her meaningful co contributions toward health equity and liberation. Denise Shanti Brown. Yeah. Our next panelist is Nia Evans, and Nia is the director of the Boston Ujima Project. Her educational background is in the areas of labor relations, education, leadership, and policy. Her advocacy includes a focus on eliminating barriers between analysts and people with lived experiences, as well as increasing acknowledgement of the value of diverse types of expertise in policy. She is the co creator along with artist Tomashi Jackson of the Frames Debate Project, a multimedia policy debate project that explores the intersection between drug policy, mental health services, and incarceration in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, Nia owns or has her BS in industrial and labor relations from Cornell University, as well as a master's in arts Master of Arts in Education Leadership with a course of study in leadership policy and politics from Teachers College at Columbia University. Welcome, Nia. Our next panelist is Charles Wallace Thomas IV. Um, Charles is a third year student at Northeastern University studying economics and mathematics with a minor in psychology. At Northeastern, Charles is the director of the Northeastern Students Against Institutional Discrimination, uh, a coalition of student activists confronting institutional marginalization by empowering students to become better organizers through political education and direct action. As a philanthropic st strategy advisor for the Columbus Foundation, 
Foundation, Charles helps to align funding with the needs of the city's most marginalized communities. He has also co-led the Northside Vitality Project at New Rules Benefits uh, Corporation, and he has studied North Minneapolis uh, economic ecology and residents' sense of economic agency and self-determination, and has worked as a research assistant for the Center for Economic Democracy. Let's please welcome Charles. And also, Charles currently serves as the fund associate with the Boston Ujima Project, so he and Nia also work together. Our last panelist is uh, Adolphus Opera uh, from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, his work is induced by encounters with people and their daily effort to exist amidst obstacles that define and situate their individuality uh, within their locale. He uses visual storytelling to better understand as well as to show his connection to the issues that confront him daily. And his work has been widely exhibited at several international venues, including the Tate Modern in London. Welcome, Adolphus. All right. So similar to a lot of our conversations from earlier in the day, um, how this is going to operate is that I'll pose the panelists uh, a collective um, question and then go into some individual ones. And then we'll wrap up with another uh, question to the full group and go into Q&A. But there, there's like this bonus question that everybody's eager to answer. So we're gonna, like, we're gonna toss that in there uh, as well. But to start us off, one of the things that I, I feel is so pressing when we think about um, our, our future um, as designers, as black folks, is the ways in which we are still wrestling and struggling with the present. And right now, it's, it's hard to uh, deem designing in the future when we have so many pressing issues facing the black body. Um, not just police brutality, mass incarceration, but also looking at reproductive rights, looking at our, our trans brothers and sisters and our, our siblings who are enduring such like drastic scales of, of murder, uh, looking at the well-being of children. And when you take this into consideration in your practices and even just your point of view as people, my, my question to you is like, how do we design the future when our communities have been through generations of trauma and when we're still suffering? And how do we design for joy in the midst of it all? Any of y'all can answer that one. <laughs> so, okay, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, so I work at the Boston Ujima Project, and Ujima is really special, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the design of it in a bit. Um, but it, in a nutshell, it's the first ever community-owned and democratically governed investment fund in the nation um, that's owned by residents of Boston here, uh, concentrated uh, with residents of Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. Um, and so the principle underlying Ujima is that people understand how they're hurting and so are in the best position to articulate what is necessary for them to heal. Um, and Ujima seeks to invest in infrastructure like businesses and organizations um, to help them do that work uh, with the premise that in order for people to thrive, we have to take care of the, the preconditions um, for them to imagine and, or to, to be inspired. Uh, so we plug into resistance work that's happening now that is aimed for us to continue holding on to the gains that we do have or the, the activist frontline or direct organizing that's working. Um, but we also seek to give people the space to come together and think about what is it that they want um, in their most ideal communities and then give them the chance to allocate funds towards that. Hello, can you hear me? And uh, I'll add to that. Um, which is, it's handy to have two, two people from one organization uh, on a panel. Um, so what are, what are some of the ways that we do that? Um, as Charles said, we position ourselves, we, we have a very strong informal organizing infrastructure in Boston. So I do think that that's one thing that's important to state because we're coming from different places um, and it's, in, it's important to do a landscape survey and see what types of uh, actors and what types of um, stakeholders you have where you are. Um, we happen to be fortunate in Boston um, that we have a lot of grassroots um, orgs who are, uh, 
powerful um, and who are effective. And so as Charles said, we've plugged into those movements. So we've started, uh, we've started off with pre-existing relationships that we had with them. Before I was the director of Ujima, I was the uh, director of the Boston branch of the NAACP, for example. And Aaron Tanaka, um, who I would say Ujima is largely his brainchild, was the director of an organization called Boston Workers Alliance. And so we were able to build on pre-existing uh, relationships with organizers in the area um, and then position ourselves, um, which, is, which is important because we were able to position ourselves uh, as a new organization who would not come in and threaten resources because we were the new shiny thing, um, but as an organization that would come and build off of the work that they were, that they were doing and say, we are what's next. Uh, so you were doing really important resistance work. You're doing really important work uh, fighting off the bad. Um, when we win, because we will win, um, we're going to look up from the rubble and we're, we're going to be able to say, here's an example of, of uh, what's, what's next. Um, so we've done it with things like just having a party. Um, so uh, one of the first things we did uh, shortly after I became the director is we linked up with artists and cultural organizers in the area who had come up to us and said, we like what you're doing and we want to create a parallel autonomous artists and cultural uh, organizing network um, to amplify what, what you were doing. Um, and we said yes. So I think that that's another um, lesson is um, just saying yes um, when our fellow uh, peers and our fellow community members um, ask us uh, to partner. Um, and we had a party. No agenda, uh, no fundraising. You didn't see any uh, collateral in the building. We used um, there was a place called Inner Sanctum, which was which was kind of like an ab abandoned warehouse, kind of, um, with a bunch of artist studios. And we we linked up with them, and we just said, everyone, just come have a party. So just talking about joy. Um, so for us. We were also really intentionally thinking about what brings us together, um, and how we bring uh, how we bring different uh, communities together. Because we have a strong informal organizing infrastructure, for example, we have a lot of community meetings. Um, we have a lot of community meetings that are very problem oriented, and again, they're strong, they're powerful, they're doing um, they're doing powerful work, and we recognize at the same time it can be depleting. So even the strongest person um, can can get down after certain types of engagements. And so, again, we're important to think about. We we're intentional in thinking about what do we rally people around. So we have enough people who are doing that resistance work. Let's now rally people. Around around coming together and, and looking forward and saying, what is it that you want? And we're, we're someone, I think a woman who asked a question about begging to be at the table or begging for resources. What's great about Ujima is we're able to say not only visualize what you want, but we have the resources to actually just go ahead and do it. So we're not going to take your vision and then go ask someone else. We're going to take your vision and we're just going to do it. I wanted to talk a little bit like breaking down generational trauma, joy, like what, what that means a little bit, at least is how um, it has shown up in my work. And so something was mentioned earlier about the future, right? It not being 30, 100 years from now, but there are actually people um, in our communities where the future is thinking about tomorrow, is thinking about next week, next month, and how we can navigate those everyday lives and, and what's happening and showing up. And so for some of us, the future and thinking about how we're going to experience joy is, is like what does our next breath look like when it comes to our healing? How do we want to show up tomorrow and move in our bodies and, and what that can look like as well? And so this idea of imagination, and you spoke to that a little bit, Charles, um, I, I think we haven't really had this space to dream, to rest our bodies, to have the opportunity to even think about what imagination is and what we can visualize for ourselves. And so what does it look like for us to utilize imagination as a healing technology and spend that time um, in creating spaces where that cultivation and activation of things that we do vision and, imagination and imagine can happen. And so I think there's joy in the possibility of that. How can we create spaces where we can prototype better possibilities for ourselves? Would you add? Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> for me, it's a different thing because um, back home in Nigeria and Lagos, these structures don't exist. There's basically no structure for a lot of things. And um, we have to create them ourselves. 
as an artist, as a photographer, um, my photography, first of all, seeks to understand. That's for me, to understand my space. A space I find myself at every point. So um, most times, um, I photograph to understand, first of all, and hopefully to explain to people what exactly I'm seeing. Now, for projects that has to do with impact, human impact, um, in 2010, we did a project. Okay, I'll come back to that later, but the project basically talks um, basically, it's about taking certain youths in a particular area in a slum and not just teaching them stuff, but first of all, making them understand that it all depends on them. Because most times, um, back at home, everybody says, oh, it's the government, is the system. It's, but again, we've come to realize that there's no system. You have to create things yourself from the scratch. So making them understand that um, you can be who you want to be. The only limitation is your mind. And most times, people are limited by the spaces they find themselves in. These guys live in slum, so probably the father is a, is a fisherman, the mother, um, um, so sorry, the father is a, farm, is a carpenter, the mother sells fish, and things like that. And they can't think beyond that box for 20, 30, 40 years, they have been living in that environment. So over time, you see generations, generations have that limitation. But we've gone there over, over the years, over the past nine years, we've made them understand that um, it's not about teaching you this and this and this. What do you do with it after that? What happens? Because knowledge sometimes becomes redundant when you don't use it. You just like, oh, I know this thing, and you forget about it. But the idea is to help you change your thinking, help you see the world bigger than the space you find yourself. That is the limitation we have every day back home, individuals, because now you look at the system that doesn't work, virtually nothing works, and you, what do you then aspire to be? Where do you aspire to? <laughs> There's nothing to aspire to, basically. Before you know, you fit into the system and it's business as usual. But we, we, we went to a society, a community rather Makoko, we took youths of a particular age, age grade, 12 to 18, um, this was many years back, and that's just one of the projects we've done under the Silent Majority Project. And we made them understand that it has to start with you. Think about it. If you can think it, you can do it. And again, I, when I play the video, I would, you probably see what they have become over time. All right, thank you. I want to go back to some of what you were laying out, Denise, in terms of um, setting a common language and really being uh, intentional about the language that we're using. Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer that if we don't invest in our wellness, we will spend the rest of our lives investing in our illnesses. And how do we uh, get to a point where um, we can collectively be well. And so your, your, your practice is called Design for the Well-Being of Black Women. Could you define how you or like express how you define uh, well-being and how do you design for well-being? Yes. Um, so to talk about how, I, I got to back up and talk about why. Yeah. All right. Uh, why this work started. And I, since I was a young girl, I've been navigating depression and anxiety and seeing it manifest uh, within my own family, within other black women uh, communities and spaces where we didn't have the opportunity or didn't feel safe enough to express those things. And so I, I, I didn't have uh, the safety to feel like I could express. I also didn't know that with the creativity that I had as a young girl that I could also build tools for myself to help me enter into a healing process. And three, that I could trust myself as a black woman, as, as the expert of my own body, health, and needs. And so when I decided to enter into this practice of thinking about social design, I, I went to social design at MICA, um, I, I knew that I wanted to specifically focus on health and black women, and I knew that it wasn't gonna be easy at the institution that I was at, and as the only black woman in the cohort, but I did it anyway. And it was an opportunity for me to, one, go to Baltimore. I'm not from Baltimore, but I knew that I was going to be invested in that city, and I wasn't going to go in and do research and dip out. And so I spent time getting to know the women who, maybe not all of them were from there, but they had roots, and Baltimore was their home. And so having interviews, hearing their healthcare experiences, 
and what they were experiencing in and outside of the healthcare system really in those points in the journey that were causing some pain points more than pleasure points in the process. And what I heard is that we were experiencing things that in black womanhood in this intersection of health and equity or um, injustice that was disproportionately impacting our minds, our bodies, the spaces that we were in, and also um, our spirit, our connection or disconnection to, to what we were able to tap in spiritually. And so that was an opportunity for me to really pose this question uh, and think about what the problem really was. And that, yes, we're experiencing health and equity, but we're also being marginalized in the design process. Because what I saw in these stories were black women were being very creative in ways that they were finding alternative methods to care for themselves. And so there's these health care interventions that we're interfacing with all of the time are being designed without our voices, our ideas, at the center, and we are outside of that space. And so some of the images uh, behind here come from that process, and I really entered it with the question of how might we center black women as leaders in the design process to reimagine collective well-being creatively and holistically. And the response to that came through design for the well-being of black women. And I was excited to like really launch this session uh, and have it be this hands-on experience where black women can come in, talk about um, some of the health concerns and actually learn some prototyping processes and have the opportunity to experiment and play and ideate around health concerns that matter to them. I was excited and I was also really scared. Mm. Um, I remember having a, a conversation with someone in the studio um, about this idea. We were about to launch uh, in about a couple of weeks, me and co-facilitator, where's Inde? Hey. Hey. Um, shout out to Inde because I had a conversation with someone and I told them about this idea and they basically told me that black women wouldn't be interested in design and that we especially wouldn't be interested in using it as a tool for healing and health. And so I cried <laughs> after that conversation. I was really upset and I was also really angry, more angry at the fact that they didn't think it was possible and that we didn't have capacity to do that. And looking back at that conversation, it made me, it reinforced the present reality of how marginalized we are in the design field and also discredited for our capacity to be creative in our healing. I called Inde. <laughs> Uh, after that conversation and told them what happened and they were like, mm -mm. <laughs> no, this has to happen. We have to try this. There's no way, we're, we can't be the only two black identifying women who are interested in design and strategy. We have to try this and see what happens. Um, and so we did. Um, we launched the first session. Black women showed up to every single session that we offered. So much so, like DMs and emails off the chart uh, in Instagram, and we created a new session um, based on um, the, the inquiries and curiosity that we were receiving from folks um, to, to start something new. And so we did it, uh, and we were able to tap in uh, to the access and space that, that I had. So me recognizing that I was coming from a place of privilege and access, uh, being uh, at MICA and having received my master's, and that I could give them the share, exchange, the knowledge that I had acquired while being in the program and going through that one year experience. Um, that eventually turned into a, a six month cohort it started off as a 90 minute session and there were five black women who decided that they wanted to invest in like how could we take the tools that we were creating centered around things like mental illness, uh, bias and discrimination and black women's labor, emotional labor that we navigate all of the time, um, toxic relationships, tools being built to really assess the health of your relationship and how we can kind of navigate and, and, and shift out of that in a healing way. And also, um, one of the things that comes up, uh, one of the women was, was exposed to the process of journey mapping, if some of y'all are familiar with that, and thinking about what are all the points um, that a black woman goes through in before 
um, interfacing or engaging with the healthcare system to being in it to going out of it and and how can we make that the most black affirming space possible that supports the unique needs of black women so I was like I don't know what I'm doing but this is something that I'm really passionate about and I know that other people care about this work will you join me and they did um, and I'm continuously giving gratitude to them for joining me in in the journey and so there's we've hardly ever any time and space um, to really give attention to our own creativity and healing we're always offering it to other people and other systems and so really my role um, as a facilitator and also a, a well-informed guide uh, throughout this as well um, is to to provide space where we can give attention to the inherent brilliance and creativity that we do possess and hold within us. And we can allow that to emerge and manifest and for us to have access to the tools to do that, to just to, to play and then think about what's possible, to think about the joy that exists in, in, in that. Um, and to do it in a supportive community. And that's what we did. Uh, we did it for six months week to week, me making sure that groups of black women were walking through MICA, like we are here in the studio, we are designing and we are sharing the resources and, and I wanna make sure that they are seen and that they are welcome into this space. And so, thanks. <laughs> Clap it up. Um, to talk about like defining it though, um, well-being for me is very connected to creativity, like deeply connected to creativity. And it's about um, having the opportunity to, to really actualize um, futures that are liberating and also vibrant. And through design, through that process of design, and to make sure um, from, from my work and in my life's work and perspective that the, the bodies, minds, and hearts of black women are the ones decide, deciding what that is and for us to define well-being. Wow, wow. I, I, wanna, I wanna add some more perspectives into this. For, for you, Nia, for you, Charles, for you, Adolphus, um, when you hear the word well-being, what's coming into mind for yourselves and your, your definition of it? Um, for me, well-being simply means a state of satisfaction for me. Because, you know, um, again, it's, it has to do with the, our whole body system. You know, um, a lot can a lot can make someone um, like sick, so to say. Um, it could be a feeling. It could be an ailment. You know, sometimes, okay, in very practical terms, you can um, feel sick from a bad news. <laughs> That's practical. And you can be sick. You actually have a cold but you're not feeling sick. You're feeling very strong. <laughs> Probably because of something happened, there's an excitement within you, and you don't feel sick, you don't feel sick at all. So for me, it's, um, it's, it all depends on from within me, what am I feeling from within me? Then that would probably show if I'm sick physically or not. But either way, Again, nobody knows that. It's happening all within me. I'm talking about myself as a person now. And for a lot of other colleagues, I, people I know. Yes, and so um, well-being for me is um, a state of mind, basically, from within. It comes from within. Yeah. Before you uh, answer, Charles and Nia, I, I also want to add into this, within your practice, of like defining community design in the process of healing, um, what, what is it that the design field can learn from the ways that you're engaging with this as well? Um, so I'll start off by answering the what is, what is well-being question. For me, well-being is, this is kind of an indirect definition, is correlated with the degree to which people are liberated, um, or which the degree to which people have agency and self-determination. Um, because sort of what our life is, or the, the material conditions of our life are dictated in part by the choices that we are able to make. Um, 
And a lot of the choices are made for us in, in the context of oppression. So I don't have the choice to go eat fresh fruits and vegetables because I live in a food desert because of all of these systematic issues, which sort of predicated that. Um, so how Ujima addresses this in her practice, and I think what um, perhaps traditional or orthodox uh, fields of design can learn from us is um, just the participatory nature of identifying how to uh, fulfill needs. Um, so Ujima seeks to design sort of its democratic processes so that people are able to identify that which is uh, most sacred to them um, and then allocate sort of resources in both terms of time, um, in terms of like organizing, like people organizing, um, and in terms of dollars uh, to to realize those, those ideations of what is um, ideal uh, for them. Thank you, Charles. Um, so not surprisingly, we work together. We, our values aligned. <laughs> um, I agree with a lot of what uh, Charles has just said, so I'll just probably say just a little differently. Um, so I would say my personal definition of well-being is, is freedom. Um, which is not unlike uh, thinking about um, degrees of liberation. Um, and freedom, and, and I would say our humanity being uh, fully acknowledged and recognized is, is how I would, I would define well-being. Um, I, th I think, um, and I'm just also just thinking about some of the things that, that Denisa said, uh, just about what types of conversations we're centered in and how. Um, and I do ultimately think um, that we are left out of these processes because we are not regarded as human. And so um, I believe if that our humanity um, was, was actually uh, deeply felt by other people at core, um, a lot of these conversations we wouldn't even have because um, there, would, there would just be no debates. Um, about about whether or not we should have um, uh, high quality, um, affordable, accessible health care. That just that would not be a debate um, if we were talking about people. Um, so when I think about well-being, um, that's that's what I think about is um, on our daily walk, is our humanity respected? Are we free? Um, how constrained or unconstrained are our choices? Um, so how does that show up in Ujima's practice? So again, Charles talked about this a little bit, and what can a design field learn from this? Um, I am not in the design field, so um, I, should, I should say I'm not speaking as an, as an insider in the design field um, or planning. I think our work uh, touches planning as well. Um, I am speaking as definitely as an outsider, as an observer, um, as a person whose work has brought me uh, to these fields. Um, and one of the things that I think maybe the field can learn, and, and I was I missed um, the bulk of the conference, unfortunately, because I'm fighting off a cold as well. Um, but I was told that there was a comment in one of the earlier panels about um, engagement, so about what about the role of community engagement and equity. And my understanding is um, uh, the exhortation was that's not enough. Um, and I would say I agree. Um, so I would say with what I have observed, um, the field has been content with a certain type of engagement um, or a certain type of input gathering and has stopped there um, and, and has done input gathering in all sorts of cool ways. So there are charrettes and it's colorful and it's visual and you know we're dancing while we're giving input. Um, but, <laughs> but then the decision <laughs> still does not reflect the input. And so one of the things that, that I say is embedded in, that I think um, Ujima um, is very intentional about, I think we, I th we can definitely always be better, is I, I would say there's a direct line between uh, community voice and our decisions. Um, we do not have masses of intermediary bodies um, that take what people are, are giving us and uh, we don't translate. Well, that's not true. Um, we think about accessibility because we are in the finance and investment field. There's some jargon, um, so we do that kind of translation. But but I think in terms of processes and and um, values, uh, we don't automatically jump to translation. So we don't we don't um, we don't um, silo. 
uh, expertise, so we don't say community expertise is a certain kind of expertise, and that's over here. And I've, I've, I feel like I've seen that a lot in the design and planning, the professional design and planning field. Uh, we don't say, uh, here's, here's the moment for the real expertise, and now this you know, community expertise is, is coming in because it should be there, and then the real expertise is going to pick up um, and take us the rest of the way. Um, so we, we recognize multi uh, we're, we're, mul we're all multidimensional beings. Uh, we bring uh, all sorts of expertise, whatever our background is, and I think we really work um, to respect that. And again, as I said, um, what community members tell us, we actually do it. Um, as an example, we've just completed a ballot on 150 businesses that have been named by community members. And so when Charles talks about the process, to be more specific, what we do is we have uh, assemblies where we bring between 100 to 200 uh, community members in each neighborhood, and they're, they're based on neighborhoods. And we ask community members, what are the businesses that you love? because these are the businesses that we are going to actually invest dollars in if they want it. Um, what are the businesses um, that we need? What's not here that you would like to see? Um, and what are the businesses that you would like to replace? Um, and so we've gotten a list of 150 businesses that we will now then go out and interview. We'll find out what their needs are. And these are businesses owned by people of color um, in communities of color. Um, and again, as I said, we don't have intermediary bodies that will say, well, should, don't you want to add this business to the list? Don't you want to take that business off? Um, so I think that that's one of the ways it shows up in practice. Wow. I actually want to go back to, to something you said earlier um, in regards of like if the, the, the well-being of black folks was already being considered, we wouldn't even have to have these types of conversations. And my, my question to, to all of you is, in the future, like what is what is required for black bodies, black spaces, black communities, black culture to be treated as sacred? And how do you break that down um, from your vantage point? Yeah, kick gonna, it off. I'm gonna steal a line from Denise, which was, um, it's, it's happening right now. Um, so I think one of the things when I think about designing for joy, designing for healing, I'm also, I also think about audience. Um, so I don't think we are able to convince people who see us as human um, that we are human. So I think those of us, and this is, this is what I think, this is an, an organizational principle. Um, I think there, 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 there are those of us who do that work and it's important work. I think the proportion of people who do that work is out of balance uh, to the proportion of people who should be considering us as their audience. And when I say people, I'm talking about black people. Um, so um, are we designing for ourselves? Or are we designing um, for other people um, to see value that we are we are trying to prove to them? Um, so that, that's something that I think about. Um, and so when Denise says the future is happening now, I think um, it's our job to to see what's happening and amplify what's happening, to resource what's happening, uh, to support. Um, uh, what's happening. There was something else I was going to say. Uh, but I lost, oh, so I was going to say, um, you know, one of my, um, a lot of my heroes are writers. And so this just makes me, when, when I think of who I, who I tap when I think about this, Toni Morrison, um, for example, just when I think about audience, when I think about someone who was very clear, who was clear about who her audience was and who was important, um, Toni Morrison has been someone that has, that has served as an example for me. There's that clip with Toni Morrison, the interview she was doing. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and she, but she did it with like Wait, class. Break it down just in case there are some folks who have no well, clue what you're talking video, about. Well, there was a video, oh, don't make me do that. I, <laughs> it was, she was being interviewed and the interviewer said like, do, do you think, I'm gonna mess this up, but basically why are you only writing for black people? Like, can you not write for other audiences? And, and Tony was like, what you just asked me is very racist. And you would not be asking me this if I weren't a black woman. But she, the way she explained it and talked about it was like, she didn't raise her voice. She, she gave a very direct and clear response and like laid it all out to where she, at the end of it, the, the white woman was convinced like, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> 
Uh huh. Like, okay, now I understand. Yeah, keep going. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, so what's required? I think um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that's been said, and I'll also add sort of my own perspective that's not necessarily an organizational perspective. Um, I think we need to uh, exist within a system that allows us to, to realize our inherent values as human beings. Um, so in the previous panel, the 1619 Project was, was mentioned, and one of the seminal essays in that project is uh, exploring the, the correlation between slavery and capitalism. Um, specifically in the United States. And I think in a, a system, or rather in a set of economic systems that, that capitalism dominates, where it's a method of production that necessarily requires that individuals are extracted from and not viewed as humans, um, we won't be able to, to flourish as, as people, both in sort of the limited sense as having access to the basic resources that are necessary to survive, and in the more expansive sense, in um, in, this, in the sense of being able to pursue those goals and dreams and ambitions which we feel define us and fulfill us as human beings. Um, for example, going to college and, and studying what you want to study or not feeling that you need to go to college in order to sort of make a living. Um, and so I think we need to orient ourselves more towards cooperation, which is something that we're sort of, speaking of biomimicry, going back to the previous panel, we are evolutionarily um, designed to do, or, or living organisms are designed to cooperate um, to, maximize, uh, to maximize the extent to which uh, uh, we survive and flourish. Oh. Yeah, for me, basically, I think um, it starts with us. We have to, first of all, start treating ourselves right. Back at home, where I come from, um, back in Lagos, okay, Nigeria, um, like I said earlier, most of these structures don't exist. So for those that are creating them, it's a struggle every day. It's a hustle. And uh, most times you do the things and you see um, people that are meant to collaborate with you, collaborate with you are probably dragging you down. So I think it begins with um, us. We, we have to, first of all, support ourselves. That's something that's lacking a lot, even from back from home. Um, we create the systems which doesn't exist at all and then we collaborate amongst ourselves. So probably when we start treating ourselves right, then people can treat us better. Wow. So I, I want to stay on you, Adolphus, uh, for, for a second. So I was listening to this podcast recently uh, that featured Erica Al Alexander, and she was uh, talking about how, you know, thinking about futurism as a black creator. Uh, if you don't know Erica Alexander, uh, Maxine Shaw, attorney at law uh, from Living Single. Um, <laughs> And she, in this, in this podcast episode, she was talking about how she created her company because she had uh, been talking to this um, movie exec or producer, and he said to her, or she, she posed the question, um, why aren't there enough black people in these space and science fiction movies? And he said to her, well, black people don't see themselves in the future. And uh, you know, she said it as her purpose to prove him wrong. Um, and if you think about like Will Smith, he's like the top sci-fi person. Uh, but um, as a photographer, there is a lot of responsibility that might come uh, to you in terms of depicting who black people can be, uh, both now in the present as well as in the future. And my, my question to you is, how have the works that you've, you've created, uh, the, the places that you've photographed people, informed and influenced the way you understand our, our future? <sighs> OK. <laughs> OK, basically, like I said initially, um, like you mentioned, I photograph to understand better. Mm -hmm. And um, then hopefully to make people understand as well. Um, having said that, photography for me I think is a strong tool where I constantly hope and again, I can give you um, a couple of success stories that people can use to understand that um, this is black, but it could be gray. Gray could be the future, but are you thinking it also? Because my, my idea about my work also is to probably help people um, think outside the box, so I don't give it all out, you know. So my work also revolves around a lot of research. So sometimes the images may appear very simple, but in the conversation, you understand there are different layers of it. 
So again, um, um, you don't give it all out. So constantly, as much as I try to understand, I also try to help people think it's, yes, an image is meant to speak a thousand words, but um, are you thinking it? You know, so probably they're point, they just pointers to help you think outside what you're seeing. So that's basically what, what I do, that's what my photography does, does every day. Um, there are projects we've done there are projects we've done, like the Southern Majority Project, like I mentioned earlier, where it's an interdisciplinary art project. It's um, a creative um, 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 intervention that we started a couple of years back. And it's transcended beyond trying to teach people how to make pictures, how to make video. But it's, like I said, it's, it's, the idea was to make them think outside the box of the locality they find themselves. You want to be a pilot. Very crazy ideas some of them have. Some people living in slums, and um, for them, it's it's they're fascinated about it. And if, as far as they're concerned, it will never happen. But projects like this um, was it was meant to make them understand. Well, I made them understand that um, how well are you thinking about it, and what steps are you taking towards achieving it. Yes, and so I started from teaching photography. We brought people that spoke to them. A lot of people that they watch on TV come talk to them, tell them how they got there. And for me, um, nine years gone, we have seen um, success stories. A lot of success stories from these places. We've done projects also in, um, in, we've done two projects in Lagos, we've done in Uganda. We've done, recently, last year, we did a project in the uh, maximum security prison, Kirikiri, in Lagos. And that was targeted, um, again, trying to work around the criminal justice system in Nigeria. Um, so when you leave prison, we're trying to help you not go back to prison. Because again, that happens a bit too often. So you come out of prison. For those that are living three to six months before their time um, out of prison, we do a training for them. And not just training again, we speak to them. Again, these guys, a lot of, a lot of these guys have lost hope. So they are thinking of leaving prison to go back right back to what they were doing, which is crime, again. so. Um, Getting the feedback from them, realized that um, some of them didn't even learn the photography that they were, were teaching them. But for them, they, were snapped, they became so excited about leaving prison because they really had an idea of what to do. You know, we get the feedback from them, we realized that their mind has totally turned around. You know, and for me, that was the essence of the whole thing. Um, there's a video. Um, this, okay, this is from the. I can't, I can't see it forever, but this is from the um, training at the prisons. Mm -hmm. If you can make it fast, actually. Play the video. Basically, um, I would, if the video plays, then it saves me a lot of trouble to explain. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's playing. Okay, um, no audio. Okay. The silent majority is a long list of struggling people, young people. You can just imagine the young girl who goes to motto parks or the young boy who has to wake up as early as 4 a.m. to sell popcorn or ice cream on the streets, where you have a lot of crazy drivers and vehicles and stuff. It's just um, a term for any child that is struggling with life, especially talented kids who are in poor communities. They are the silent majority. to a group of artists. So we had a group exhibition in then the Nimbus Art Center, which is where I met Adolfo Sopara. When I took this topic, which was um, eradicating child abuse in Nigeria, for the first time, I showcased one, one or two paintings that actually expressed my feeling about the kids, generally. So that was sort of the point that, you know, that got me um, inspired to do more. The one day I was at CCA, Center of Contemporary Arts, Sony Yaba, I was just thinking, I was just, something just made, took my mind there. I said, okay, Marco, I go to Marco very often, you know? And okay, I'm like, I've stayed there, I've slept there, you know, like my another home for me. This is Shalala, so actually do it there, you know? 2009, I just got a call out of the blues. And I said, Shalala, we have to do this in now. So I said, yes, let's go there. And then he took me to this community. 
The first time I, I, I went to Makoko, I was in shock because I, I couldn't really believe that that kind of community existed within Lagos State. There was a permanent stench in that environment. I couldn't breathe properly. They feed their children in this kind of environment where you have feces just floating by. The kids are washed in the water. Restaurant on water, you have <laughs> vegetable markets on water. I mean, you just need to visit this community. Photographers from all over the world have braved canoe rides on the Dredgy Lagoon to capture shots of Makoko, a community built on stilts that sprawls below Lagos' third mainland bridge. Yet few Makoko residents have ever seen their pictures. Makoko is as photogenic as it is poverty-stricken, and its residents have grown used to the intrusive lenses of strangers. You look at, you're driving by, you see this place, oh wow, on water, it takes pictures from the top, it looks nice. What happens if you now go down? You now, after they go down, you now take pictures. Then another thing draws you further closer to them, the individuals you meet. They are very welcoming people, they are very happy people, you know. No matter how um, you want to look at it, however impoverished you might think they are, they are very um, happy people. Many, many clicks later, these uninvited visitors leave with images to be shared with other strangers. The population here in Makoku is over 270,000 people living here. And imagine how many kids don't have the privilege of education here in this environment. Some people that have been in this environment, this community, and for 20 years they have not gone outside this community. There are people like that. And, um, and there are so many people like that, that's the majority. But they have not been empowered to say anything. So they are all silent. In order to give this silent majority a voice, Adolphus Okwara and Shola Otori decided to do something different. Empower these photographic subjects to take ownership of their images and help shape a narrative that cannot be told fully without their input. For me it was I was willing to see, okay. Well, I know that we're not going to watch the, the entirety of it. Uh, as a quick, shameless plug, where can people go and find it? Um, I think, okay, um, it's on YouTube, I think. Yeah. Okay. If, they just, YouTube, if you just search him on YouTube. Yeah, you start the Silent Majority Project. Okay. Yeah, and um, now this might sound very, again, I've been photographing Macro since 2005. Mm -hmm. It's one of the very first place I started photography, when I started photography. And um, it's a French-speaking community. I don't speak any French. <laughs> and uh, at the time, I don't swim either. But you have to go there by water. <laughs> so it was an interesting so, one. Here's so, my question for yeah, you. Okay. Um, I, I haven't talked a lot about my work, but I, mm -hmm. I do know that so many of my projects, so many um, experiences that I've had have left me with a lot of trauma, a mm. lot of nightmares to this day. Um, and there are certain sounds that trigger like feeling like I'm being tear gassed again. And it's, it's something to be in this work and keep producing and have all of these, you know, testaments of the good stuff that we've done. But my question to you as well as the other panelists is when we are doing the, the work and we, we are traumatized, we are feeling the effects of all of these struggles and issues, what are you doing to refuel yourself, to, to reheal, to uh, make sure that your well-being um, is intact? Um, I think it's a different thing for everybody. For me, it's um, by going to these places regularly, I'm refilled, I'm excited because um, for me, it's like I'm creating a painting, I'm making projects. The whole period, each period we have to do a certain major project. For me, it's my creation. I'm not, I can't, I can't really photograph then. I put everything, for me that is um, refilling already. You know, I, I get home tired every day, but I just want to get back there the next day. Because for me, that's, if, that's, if that ends, I want to begin another one. Because for me, that's the excitement, that's, um, 
that's like the refueling actually that they're looking for. That's the joy, that's the happiness, you know. It's all in the work <laughs> that we do because the work comes from within us. For me, it comes from within me. It's um, nobody sent us to these places. <laughs> nobody sent us to the prison. We decided, and again, getting into these places is not easy. Photographing the prison was very difficult. Um, doing the project in prison, just like here. Here, you're bringing something wonderful to a community, and they're asking you to pay for, pay to teach them. It's crazy, you know, at different times I got frustrated, I've uh, almost insulted some elderly chiefs, but um, again, for me, uh, it's beyond all of that, you know. I want to go back, because for me, that's the excitement, that's the um, joy, that's the happiness, that's the refueling I'm looking for. What's the next project? What's the next thing? Yeah. Um, there are about two parts to this. Someone earlier talked about accessibility. Um, and when it comes to like taking care of our bodies and ourselves in this process, it's so important for me to let people know that I'm type 1 diabetic. And how many of us designers are, are not are walking around, moving in our bodies, doing this work with chronic invisible illnesses and diseases that we cannot see? And I think for me, um, as someone living with a chronic invisible disease, it's been critical to make sure the care of my body is the most important part of the work. And that it's something that I consider and think about before every design process and through the entire design process. And for other people who are showing up in this space, and I'm talking about whether that's mental health uh, challenges and conditions, autoimmune diseases, physical disabilities that we can see or not. And so that is critical. I also wanted to talk about uh, taking care of ourselves in situations where we may be like, offered new opportunities, like coming to this conference uh, and me navigating like inner critic noise and imposter syndrome and all the stuff that we go through. And so the week, I was a mess, y'all, <laughs> like a couple of weeks before leading up to this and like just hearing awful things, like awful, awful shit. Oh, can I say that? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I think it's fine, <laughs> but it's being recorded, sorry. Um, but I had to, I was like, all right, what, what do I need in this moment? And for me, that involves like a creative process. And I, I didn't bring it with me um, on the stage, but I'll show y'all after if, if anyone wants to see it. I ended up designing this kind of booklet, this accordion fold that was like this entire check-in process of how I could check in with myself. I wrote affirmations in it. The cover of it was like, Denise Shante, you're gonna be a panelist at Harvard's Black and Design Conference. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and like doing that self-celebration and like intentional check-ins. Like I did a check-in with myself in this booklet before I came onto the stage. And I'm gonna check out when I go, out, when I go out and, and talk about how I feel after having done it. And so building that for myself, like that is an example of designing for well-being in action. Um, and I'm so used in the process of doing it with other people that that was also an opportunity for me to do it for myself when I know I needed it the most. I think and this may be an obvious answer um, by the by the nature that by the fact that we're here, but I think it's important to do whatever work that we're doing in community. Um, so whether it's just knowing that there is a, a set of ideas that corroborates sort of the principles that we're working with, um, or being with people physically or virtually or however else, um, just to have a sense of, of solidarity and to know that, or maybe even to take a little bit of the pressure off of us as individuals. Um, often, you know, when it feels like the world world is falling down and you're trying to do work to address it, it's like if you stop doing the work, then everything is going to fall apart, which is maybe a little bit narcissistic, but also I feel like a pressure that a lot of people feel. Um, so realizing that you know, you're not alone and there are people who have come before you who have laid the foundations for this work and there are people who are, being, who are looking at the work that you and others are doing now um, who can carry it forward even when you need to take a break and check in with yourself um, to make sure that you're all good. Um, it's, just, it's just critical to, to be in community and realize. Uh, that there are folks around you. Can you share what you share with me about speaking? Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a third year in undergrad. I have not spoken on panels before, uh, besides like before I started working with Ujima. So the first time I was asked, um, uh, it was like a spur of the moment thing, like, do you want to go, do you want to go do this? And I was like, uh, sure. Um, and so I was up the night before, like insanely late, just 
writing out points and, and reading things and seeing who I was going to cite and all this other uh, stuff. And that kind of happened the first time and the second time and the third time. And then uh, today, I was falling into that same pattern. Um, and I stopped. And I was like, this is, this is stuff that is inside of you, that you've practiced, that you've talked about, that you believe, which is why you're practicing and talking about it. So it's all good. Just go out and, and share who you are. And it'll be great. Nice. And I'll say, Charles thinks it was spur of the moment, but it wasn't. So mm -hmm. every time we asked him to speak on the panel, it's because we knew <laughs> that it was that was inside. Um, my weekends are actual weekends. Um, I do not, <laughs> except for today. <laughs> Today's fun. Um, I do not check email on the weekends. If you send me an email Friday at 5 o'clock, you will not get any type of response from me until Monday at all. Um, and I'm, I'm rigid about that. Um, so that's one way. Um, on Saturday, so my weekends are actual weekends, which means on Saturday, so I don't check email. Um, if you text me, because um, the secret is text is actually a better way to reach me than... Charles will tell you, I really don't answer emails at all. But <laughs> if you... <laughs> That's also one of the ways, actually. Just pretend they're not there. Um, <laughs> if you text me on the weekend and if it's work-related, I'm, I'm not going to respond. And I'm not, I'm not even going to respond to say, sorry, I don't do work stuff on the weekend. You'll get that on Monday, and then hopefully you'll remember that next time. Um, <laughs> Saturdays, I call my do nothing days unless black and design calls um, because I'm at home. Um, I watch Netflix. I live around the corner. So I go to Blackbird, I get donuts, I get coffee, and I'm going to watch Netflix pretty much all day. Um, <laughs> and I insist on it. I take naps. Yes, naps. <laughs> <laughs> I take I naps. Nap. Um, we're, I've been traveling a lot. We're a little busier, so I've not been able to tap, take naps regularly. But I, I've been able to pull off kind of a regular 20-minute to one-hour situation almost every day. <laughs> um, Some diligent naps. Yeah, and I think I do just want to kind of ditto Charles's, Charles's comment about working in community. Um, almost every answer that I have to most questions is relationships. Um, so I also have a, I have a crew. Um, I have uh, friends that I've been with, uh, that I've been friends with 10, 15, 18, 20 years. Um, and I know I can go to them and completely be myself and vent and, and let it all out. And I know that that's there. Um, and so I make, sh and I make sure not to look for that in every space because it isn't in every space. Um, I know that fast space is there, and and um, I I make sure. So then on that note, I think I, I make sure I treasure it, I make sure I share cherish it, I make sure I value it. So I, I make sure that in return, um, they know that that I'm I am that space for them. And then and then the last thing, just along the lines of the future is here. I'm always looking for wonderful things that Black people are doing um, to figure out how to support in any way, shape, or form that I can. Um, so if it requires me showing up, I'm there. Um, if it's a donation, if I can do it, I do it. Um, so that and, and that that is rejuvenating for me because I love seeing um, all of the different things that we are um, up to right now. Thank you. Thank you all. Can we get a, a round of applause? Yeah. Yeah. Toad, uh, that because we, we, we're kind of chatty uh, up here, um, we have time for one short question. Like, don't, don't tell your life story, just like ask the question. Yeah. I can't, I actually can't see. Um, so, unless you raise your hand like super high, I think a mic person is going to find you. Oh, in the back. Okay. Ooh. Drop that like that. 
Hi, uh, my name's Amber Nicole, um, and my question is, what, is blo what do you all think is blocking black people from engaging in healing practices? Hmm. That's a good one. <laughs> Can we all answer that? Because I do have an answer, but I'm going to defer to y'all. What's blocking people, black people, from engaging the healing process? So I have a quick answer. My friends make fun of me because whenever they ask me questions like this, I'm like, well, capitalism. Um, <laughs> it's my default answer, and it is a hill I am willing answer. to die on. My apologies. Um, but no, seriously, the, we are the system. I, you know, the system. Capitalism is programmed to make sure that we prioritize uh, profit over people, to make sure that we are valued not by who we are or, or what we can do, but how much of what we can do and what amount of time for other people to benefit from. Um, so I feel like if we, if we just examine the ways that sort of the, the institutional design, ha the ways that we haven't uh, recovered from slavery, the ways that we haven't recovered from um, needing to break into industries or you know, just feel like we have to get into the corporate space in order to, to mean anything, um, we just deprogram ourselves in these, in these subtle ways and we'll be able to, to really address healing um, in a, from a good place. Can I respond to that from like a creative healing perspective? Just with, within my work, what I notice um, with the people who are involved in the experience is this resistance to share creative ideas because they've been co-opted and stolen. And so it was so important for me to hold space for those six months with just the five women, even though other people were trying to come into the program and experience and like have me demonstrate or like, you know, for consumption. Uh, and me resisting that and saying, no, we're holding sacred space uh, during this moment because there is hesitance and resistance to get ideas out because of this fear. And we have them. We have so many. Um, but it's like, who, who do I feel safe enough to share them to uh, where we can collaborate? And I, I feel like it, it won't be... Um, it won't translate into something and become something else than what I, you know, intention it to be, or it won't be stolen from folks who aren't a part of our process. And so I think that's also a part of the resistance in, in when it comes to being creative in the healing process. For me, I think um, we are all struggling to prove a point because, you know, um, a lot of things around us limit us and make us um, rather want to hold us down. So um, something for me most times is that I want to, okay, most times I am the yardstick for myself. I want to outdo myself. I want to, um, not because I'm trying to be like somebody, because most times in my own environment, there's nobody to be like. <laughs> so you are setting the standards in what you do. So you want to outdo yourself. Sometimes not, not intentionally, but you see yourself going and going and eventually it's telling on your 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 health or your whatever you, so most times you want to outdo what you did yesterday you want to do better and in the long run it's not healthy yeah you should have the last word. yeah go for it um so again to ditto charles i think um a lot of us are tired so I think that's just an, another way of saying capitalist, capitalism. Um, a lot of us are tired. A lot of us are working hard. Um, and so um, we're coping the way we're, we're coping. Um, but I think it's important to say that we are all coping. Um, we're not not coping. Um, so even when we think about kind of like the strong black woman or strong black man trope, it isn't as if we are not seeking relief, um, we are. Um, it's just that um, some of us are doing it in ways that are that are healthy um, and beneficial, and some of us are doing it in ways that are not. But, but they're driven, I would say, by the same desire. Um, I think that's one thing. I think another thing is we're smart. Um, and the reason why I say that is because we, we're talking about generational traumas and um, so some of the generational traumas have included people saying they are here to help us and they have not and so I think we have some skepticism that is well grounded um, when I think about 
as an example, I, I, I have locks. There are only two people I let touch my hair in the entire world. Um, so I'm not going to just have, and I believe in God, I'm not going to just have anybody talking to me about my spirit, for example. Like if, if barely anybody can touch my hair, <laughs> um, then the standards are going to be even more rigorous when it comes to my soul and my mind and my, and my spirit. Um, so I think that there's some skepticism um, that, that's well grounded. And I think the way we, we, we um, break through is with, with deep relationship building. Thank you. If, if I could add to, to the answers and, and wrap us up, um, I, I believe that in some ways we have been sold and perhaps have bought and believed that we are better in our brokenness. And I, I think that we have to unlearn that lie. Um, and going back to the tropes that, you know, strong black woman, we're so resilient. Like we, we push through everything and we are struggling in the midst. And I, I, I think for generations, um, the church has served as that, that space of healing or reflection. Uh, but I, I think it's beyond time in, in some ways uh, that we really see that there are therapists for a reason. There, there are reasons that people have this career. And um, more and more, we're seeing more black practitioners and therapists. And it's OK to uh, not use the preacher or your best friend uh, for talking through all of these issues on a mental health level, um, but to also go to, to someone and, and really take that investment. Um, I, I think about how you know we do annual checkups. We get our pap smears. We get our wellness exams, no matter if we're sick or not. And to do that with our minds and our spirits, I, I think, is just as vital. Um, but we, there's some unlearning that has to do, uh, that has to come before we can collectively do that. Um, and that's also a very privileged standpoint because everyone can afford it. And so the ways in which we can make therapy, uh, mental health services more accessible is also a part of that, that coin. I, I, I think that like there's a lot that we still need to talk about. I don't know what's next, but I know that I want to go to like the Just City Cypher and keep like digging deep in some of these issues. Um, but if we can have someone from the, the leadership team like take us home, that would be really great. Yeah, clap it back up. Yes. Thank you so Oh, Can you all hear me? Okay. Thank you to this panel, to our moderator, and can we get a round of applause for all four of our panels today? Thank you. All right, so y'all, we are in the home stretch of today, and our next section is really wonderful, and we have some magic waiting for you throughout the GSD. We have breakout workshops right now. I know a lot of you already signed up, but if you didn't, I'm going to announce each workshop in the room. We have AI in the Loop, architect Architecting Equity Beyond the Earth, presented by David, David Reed Colby in room 510. We have two elevators and staircases on this side of the GSD and at the back of the GSD. We also have um, Perkins and Will will be launching their mentorship initiative. So we have a bunch of young people in the building that are going to be doing a workshop with Perkins and Will. We also have um, Black Skin and Sacred Space, an Afrofuturist Exploration of Urban Revitalization, presented by Designing in Color in Room 111. We have another Just City Lab Cipher, which will be in Room 109. And we also have Black Future Heritage Spaces, Part 1, presented by Black Space, Black Space Chicago, and Black Space Oklahoma City in Room 516. We will have volunteers and myself and the rest of our committee directing people. We're going to start immediately so we can get back here in time for the closing keynote at 620. Thank you all so much for this beautiful panel. Thank you.